Welcome to the Weekend Word with Pastor Steve McKinney. I'm really honored that you have joined me here today, and I'm blessed with this word as I've applied it to my life, and I believe it's going to bless you as you apply it to your life as well. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we love you, we worship you, we adore you, we focus our attention on you, and we expect to be changed in your presence and by your word, because your word promises that it is a two-edged sword that will cut away things that are not supposed to be there. And so we submit our lives, we submit our minds, we submit our attitudes, we submit our emotions, we submit our past, present, and future to you right now. And we ask that you be glorified in us. Show us the way, Lord, to go. Lead us and guide us. You are the good shepherd. We are your sheep. And I thank you so much that you have chosen to allow us to partner with you in this harvest. We give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. And Lord, even now, I pray for your healing presence, your healing word to flow into every heart, mind, and body, relationship, finances, difficult situations. And yes, Lord, healing of the body, as I've already said, release your healing into every body right now. Aches and pains and issues be gone right now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, my title today is a question. Will you drain your life for Christ? Will you drain your life for Christ? Now, I almost entitled it with a different word. Instead of drain, I almost used the word deplete. Will you deplete your life for Christ? And honestly, that's my favorite word. Although deplete is one of the definitions of drain and drain is one of the definitions of deplete. Let me go into this word deplete here just for a moment in case you've not uh, been familiar with it. To deplete means to spend without refilling. Uh, It means to drain out, not fill up. Okay. It means to empty out. It means to not have enough left. Okay. According to human standards. All right. Uh, Another word for deplete is it means to exhaust. And a lot of people use this word deplete uh, when it comes to their energy, when it comes to their time, and when it comes to their resources. I'm depleted of energy. I just can't do it. Our budget is depleted. We just cannot commit to that project at this time. Sometimes I'm trying to to come up with words and my mind uh, is just depleted of of thinking strength. And I will say to my wife, "Hon, my my brain is just not working right now. My brain is depleted. I need to rest first uh, before I can think straight again. But here's another interesting point. Uh, There is an opposite word to the word deplete, which means the opposite thing. And what that word is, is replenish. All right. Replenish. So we deplete our resources, but then we replenish our resources. Another way to say that is we make what we are complete again through replenishment. Now, the thing about the kingdom of God is that you don't really have to worry so much about filling yourself up as long as you're in the presence of God and as long as you're in the word. As a matter of fact, in the kingdom of God, the more you pour of yourself out, the more that God pours into you. Can I get a good witness on that? Amen. So the more that we deplete our energy, the more that we deplete our strength, the more that God takes care of us, the more that God, and you could even say it this way, the more that he rewards us because he rewards faith and it takes faith to deplete ourselves, to drain ourselves of strength and energy and resources and time. All of those things are really, really precious to us. And they're things that we really want to micromanage very carefully. But I'm here to tell you that when you're doing things for God, 
He's the one that manages the resources, including your strength, your energy, and your resources. And you can trust him and you can give all. You can give all of what you have as you are led by the Holy Spirit. And he will make sure that you will have enough until the very end when you pour out the final part of you. A good example of some guys who depleted themselves, they drained themselves, were the wise men or the Magi that visited Jesus around two years after his birth. And these wise men came from a distant land, and most scholars believe it took them about two years to reach Jesus. It was a long journey. What does that mean? The round trip was four years. And so... One of the biggest things they did was they gave four years of their lives to go and have a one-time worship service, worshiping Jesus Christ. All right. They depleted a chunk of their life. And if you really want to, you know, add in possibilities of preparation and things like that, it was really more than a four-year chunk of their life. Well, think about it, guys. If you live to to 70 years old or 60 years old, what is four years of your life? It's a big chunk. Can I just put it this way? It's a college education. All right. It's, it's a big investment. It's a big drain of their time and their resources, not to mention the fact that it was a rough journey. And so they definitely wore out a lot of the tread on their tires. It was a tiring journey. Another thing to look at is the fact that they brought big gifts, frankincense and myrrh and gold. They brought gifts for Jesus and they gave of their wealth. They gave of themselves. And that's where we get the idea, guys, of gift giving during Christmas. But we get it wrong. We give each other gifts. We receive gifts. But in reality, how it's supposed to happen, or at least the biggest part of it should be that we give gifts to Jesus. That is what Christmas is all about. But I want you to understand the Magi, the wise men were really, really, really wise because they gave a chunk of their lives, a chunk of their resources and a chunk of their time to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, where Jesus talks about this concept. And he says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Amen. This is counterintuitive. It's not normal wisdom, but it, it, it causes us to consider the way that God thinks. All right. God says, if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you will give up your life for the sake of Christ... You will save it for all eternity. Wonderful. If you're following along in your Bible, you can turn to 2 Samuel chapter 24. We're going to use some of the verses here, but I'm just going to give you the background on what's going on. Uh, There was a terrible event that happened in Israel. Uh, David was was to blame for it in a way, uh, and so he felt very bad about it. And there was a plague ravaging the country, and God, through his prophet, told David to build an altar at a specific specific place. And it was at this guy named Arauna. It was at his property that God told David to build an altar. And so it says here in verse 22 that Arauna said to David, let my Lord, the King take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering and the the threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Arauna gives to the king. And Arauna said to the king, may the Lord your God accept you. So David was going to obey God and he shows up at Arauna's property and Arauna says, you can have everything for free. You can have the wood, you can have the oxen. I'll have my guys help you. Everything is free of charge. I just want to honor you. I just want to serve you. I want to help the country. 
and may the Lord be pleased with your offering. But this was David's response. He said to Arauna in verse 24, no, I will buy this from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor. He didn't just buy the oxen and borrow the threshing floor. He bought the property. He bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the plea of the land and the plague was averted from Israel. Guys, David knew how to give good offerings, all right? He didn't want to use a borrowed or a rented piece of land to build an altar to the Lord. He wanted to make sure that whatever he gives God, it cost him something. So he bought the property, even though it was being offered to him for free. He bought the oxen, even though somebody would have given him the oxen for free. He bought the, the wood that they would use for firewood. He paid for all that stuff, top price, because he didn't want to be a cheapskate. He didn't want to be a cheapo in the eyes of the Lord. He wanted whatever sacrifice, whatever offering that he gave to the Lord to be of great value. In that way, he was very much like the Magi. In that way, he was very much like the wise men. And if you want to be wise, and if you want to be a man or a woman after God's own heart, like David is a man after God's own heart, learn to give really good, really good offerings to the Lord. Make sure that you don't show up to the Lord empty-handed. Make sure that you're being led by the Spirit of the Lord in how to drain your yourself of your time, how to drain and empty yourself of your energy, how to expend your resources in a way where you're walking the walk of faith. You're, you're living the life of faith and adventure. And you're saying, Lord, whatever I have, it belongs to you. I give to you whatever your spirit would lead me to give. I am guided by your word. I am guided by your Holy Spirit. And I'm a person that gives good offerings. Let's be people that can speak like that. Now we're going to stay in 2 Samuel and we're going to go back to chapter 23. All right. And I want you to really pay attention to this. Once during the harvest, when David was at the cave of Adullam, the Philistine army was camped in the valley of Rephaim. The three who were among the 30, an elite group of among David's fighting men, went down to meet him there. I want you to understand how David's mighty men worked, okay? There were 30 of them that were spectacular warriors. But among the 30, there were three, and they called them the three, there were three that were ultra spectacular. They were amazing warriors. And we're going to be talking in the coming weeks a little bit more about those three because we can learn a lot from those three. We can actually learn a lot from the 30 as well. But the three best warriors of David from among his 30 mighty men, they came and visited him in the cave of Adullam. And it says here that David was staying at the stronghold at that time. And a Philistine detachment had occupied the town of Bethlehem. Okay. So his favorite town was occupied by military force from the opposing side. Okay. So that town uh, that he loved was occupied and it was a time of battle. It was a time of war. And of course they would like to take it back. But as of this moment, the enemy has control over the town of Bethlehem. And so David remarked longingly to his men, the three warriors. He said, oh, how I would love some of that good water from the well by the gate at Bethlehem. David was longing for Bethlehem. He was longing uh, for that town to be liberated, but there was something about the water at Bethlehem. It, it, there was a well there that the water was just 
extra refreshing. It tasted really, really, really good. Uh, you know, I can even experience that here in my own house. Uh, I have a water filter uh, on, on a sink. And when we run that water filter on cold water, it's 100% filtered. But when we turn the water to hot, it's no longer filtered water. And so if, if, I, if I take some lukewarm water from my own sink, I taste chlorine in it. But if I go to the cold, refreshing water because it's filtered, it tastes so great because I don't taste the chlorine in it. It, okay. So different water tastes different ways. Even different brands of bottled water tastes differently. Isn't that true? All right. Maybe you're not as sensitive to it, but a lot of people, people can really pick up on that. Some people can even detect if they're drinking water that came from a plastic bottle because they can taste the plastic bottle, uh, you know, taste in the water. And there's a lot of people that they don't want to drink water that was ever in a plastic bottle. But back to the story, David remarked, I would love some of that water from the place where I can't go because it's in enemy territory at the moment. But it says here in verse 16, the three broke through the Philistine lines and they drew some water from the well by the gate in Bethlehem and they brought it back to David. They brought it back to David. I want you to understand what happened, okay? We don't know how many people there were between the three and the water in Bethlehem, okay? We don't know how many there were. Were there thousands? Were there hundreds? Were there dozens? Whatever it was, it was a lot more than three. So these three guys, because they love their king, these three guys, because they love David and, and because they are mighty men and they did do mighty acts and they were capable men, they decided, let's go get our king a drink of water. And they risked their lives and they took some serious time, okay, what many, many hours to go get that water for King David. And I don't know how long it takes to lower the, the pail into the water and bring it back up, but it's not instant, okay? It's not like a faucet, but even that took a few minutes. And so they went and they got this water for the king. I want you to look at it this way. They poured out their lives to make an offering to their king. All right. They really made a big sacrifice to make this offering for their king. But the Bible says this, David refused to drink it. And instead, he poured it out, poured it out into the ground or into the rocks. He poured it out as an offering to the Lord. Huh. Wow. All right. Can you imagine? You've been longing for this drink of this very special water for a good amount of time to the point that you were even talking about. It. Oh, how I would love a drink from Bethlehem. And these guys, they risked their lives to bring you this drink. And instead of drinking it, you say, no, no, I'm offering this to you, Lord. I'm offering this to you. I pour out this offering to you, Lord. Remember, we're reading the book of 2 Samuel. And I don't know if you remember that Samuel himself was an offering to the Lord. Samuel's mother and father gave him to the Lord after his mother had been barren for many, many, many years. And God gave them a miracle and they gave that miracle to the Lord. These are people of great faith. David knew how to give good offerings. He bought that threshing floor. He bought that oxen. And now he offered this water that was so precious, so precious to him. He offered it to the Lord. And he said in verse 17, the Lord forbid that I should drink this. 
This water is as precious as the blood of these men who risked their lives to bring it to me. So David did not drink it. What an awesome man of God, pouring out the best of his life, draining the best things in his life for the Lord, for the Lord. I'm going to bring you guys to one more scripture here today. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. And I'm going to read from the English Standard Version here today. The Apostle Paul says this, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. As a drink offering. I want you guys to understand, in the Old Testament, uh, after they sacrificed a lamb or whatever it is that they were going to sacrifice, they also poured out wine as an offering to the Lord that completed the sacrificial offering time for the Lord. Okay. And the apostle Paul is drawing on that symbolism. And he says, I'm approaching the end of my ministry. I'm approaching the end of my life. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. I'm not all the way empty yet, but I recognize that I need to pour my life out all the way to the finish line. I'm being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. Verse seven, he says this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. What is, what is Paul saying? He's saying, I've been living my life for Christ. I've been giving my all for Christ. I've been draining my life for Christ. I've been expending my life for Christ. I've been investing my life for Christ. And this time is almost over. But I know that I have fought the fight well. I know that I have finished the race, ran the race well. Therefore, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, the crown of righteousness. He was already looking forward to receiving that crown. But he ends this scripture by saying this, and I want you to to really catch this. And this crown of righteousness is not just for me, but it's for all. But it's for all. It's for everyone who has loved his appearing. Other versions say it is for everyone who has longed for his appearing. What does that mean? It's for everyone who puts their faith in Christ and they live their life with the expectation that he is coming again and they spend their lives for the gospel. They spend their lives for the sake of humanity to save as many as is possible. And they think about heaven. They think about eternity. They they think about how am I spending my life? How am I draining my life? All who long for his appearing. All who are excited about his appearing. All who love his appearing. I think my message point is pretty obvious today. Pretty straightforward today. If you try to keep your life, you're going to lose it. (laughs) But if you'll live your life for Christ, and if you'll lay down your life for Christ, and if you'll pick up your cross and follow him, you will gain eternal life. Let's be those people that our lives are an offering. Let's be those people that when we give offerings, we give precious things like that precious water 
or like the, the treasures of the wise men, or like David did when he built that altar, he bought the property, he bought the oxen. He said, I'm not going to give anything to the Lord that doesn't cost me big. Let's be those people that we drain our lives for the Lord. Father, we love you. We praise you. We give our lives to you. You are so awesome. You are so amazing and you are so worth it. Lord, I offer my life to you. I offer my time to you. I offer my resources to you. Lord, I pray that we would not be a people that we just look at, oh, you know, we just want to give a tithe. Uh, We just want to give 10%. I pray that we would be a people that actively participate in, in giving priceless gifts to you. Gifts that are monetary, sure. Gifts that are resources, sure. But Lord, our whole life, chunks, years of our lives, we offer to you. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would stir each and every heart, each and every mind, Lord, within the sound of my voice. I pray that you would stir us. Stir us as you stirred those wise men. Stir us as you stirred David. Stir us as you stirred Paul. And let our lives be poured out as a drink offering. All for your glory. Now, Lord, I do pray for physical healing to flow into every heart, mind, and body. I pray, Lord, for your thoughts to invade our minds and our thoughts. I pray that our actions would line up with your word and with your righteous requirements. I pray, Lord, that our attention would be focused on you. And I pray, Lord, that we would change the way that we have fun and that we would participate in the amazing and exciting and fun kingdom of God rather than wasting our times on this pointless and void and empty world. Now, Lord, I place a hedge of protection around each and every one. Lead us, guide us, speak to us, protect us, use us, all for your glory in Jesus' mighty name. Lift your hands. Lift your hands to the Lord and receive his presence, his love. Receive his touch in your life and in your heart right now. Jesus' name. Receive his presence wherever you are in Jesus' name.